Hello, everybody. My name is Joel Filderman, and welcome to the Dog Trainers Connection. I'm not a dog trainer, but these other people you see here are. Uh, we get together and discuss a topic, uh, come up with some thoughts, some ideas, and sometimes some answers. Um, and uh, the trainers that you see here have many years' experience in the training world and uh, always have some interesting thoughts and ideas to add to our discussion. So, um, Today's topic, what I'd like to discuss today is, um, what I'd like to discuss is, how do I put this? What, how much of a difference does a trainer make? How much of a difference does a trainer make with a dog? Is it the dog or is it the trainer? And the reason I was thinking about this was I was thinking about a couple of things. I was thinking about something that I'm sure that you as trainers all hear that my dog is untrainable. And then the other reason that I thought of it was that I was think I was uh, doing some research for today's episode and I found a article about a uh, dog that has been cloned in China that the reason that they cloned the dog is that the dog was a police dog and they're trying to cut down on the training time that it takes to make a, a police dog. So really the question is, is how much is the trainer? How much is the dog? And um, Steve, let's start with you today. Well, I mean, I think it's, I don't care if you clone it or not, you know, you're not getting the same dog out. I mean, it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. What do they think? It's going to be born with like skills and knowledge. You they, know? they said uh, something to the effect that it had a high propensity for uh, using those skills that a police dog needs, even at whatever age it was cloned at. Well, guess what? I mean, you can go to any working bloodline of like, uh, Malinois, German Shepherd Dogs, Giant Schnauzers, there's a whole batch of breeds that have like strict working lines. And, and the reason they have those lines is because those dogs have the strong propensity to behave that way. So cloning is, uh, I mean, we're going a little too far here. It's all about bloodlines. And then it's really about the dog, you know, because you could do your best to try to produce. Uh, I often use the guide dog industry as a, an example of breeding their own stock for years and years and years and still have a reasonable failure rate with the progeny because they don't all turn out in a way that one would think based on the genetic possibilities. I mean, you know, look, this spontaneous kind of uh, genetic mutations and things. I mean, it's, it's complicated genetics. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know about this cloning thing. It's, it wouldn't go for me. I believe that if, if you want a certain, if you want a show dog, you, you, you buy the progeny of generations of show dogs. If you want a work dog, you try and find a dog that comes from generations of working lines. And I think that that's how you stack the odds the best, but that's, that's, there's no guarantees. Okay. And, and Jeff, is this just another example of nature versus nurture? I mean, if you take the best dog and put him with a crappy trainer, nothing good's going to come of it, right? I mean, you have to have somebody who's got the skills. I mean, if, if you take a, a real gifted trainer, a lot of times they can take a mediocre dog and really kind of turn out, right? Because they've just got it. Now, I just saw this thing. They got this new movie out, right? With um, A Dog's the, Journey. Is that the one you're talking about? I'm thinking about the one that's uh, John Wick. Oh, yeah. They got Malinois right? So I, I saw some interview by the director. They say it took months to find the five Malinois that they used for, to make the film. And then it took months for the actors to form relationships with the dogs so that the dogs would work with them on set. So they didn't have a trainer on the side saying, do this, do that, and giving them all kinds of gestures. Mm -hmm. They trained the actors to handle the dogs, which I thought was cool. I mean, I love that. The fact that they took that kind of time and effort, uh, 15 months or something like that, of like relationship building and training, I, I was impressed. I'm like, things are getting better so, in some ways. I mean, that was great. But it's still months yeah. looking for the right dogs. And you can bet that they were looking at the right bloodlines right from the beginning, but they needed those dogs that were social enough, that could do the work and all that other stuff. And, you know, what can I say? We all want those dogs. 
Right. And, and as I actually, I appreciate what you said, Steve, but I actually was asking Jeff, uh, what that's okay. That's all right. I asked Jeff, I said, is this another example of nature versus nurture? Um, I don't know if cloning and it should be associated with either. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know anything about cloning. Uh -huh. I do know that there's this little thing in the dog world. It's about 15,000 years old. It's called selective breeding. Mm -hmm. and I heard of it somewhere. <laughs> right. Right. And is there any difference between that? and? Uh, well, I, I can't talk about cloning. I can talk about, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Steve touched on bloodlines and ancestry. Uh, obviously, that would be a good place to start if you're, you know, I mean, are, are all breeds police dogs? No, they choose the breeds that do that work the best. So, you know, I, I you know, but again, I, if, where is this happening? In China. China. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I have no comment on cloning. You know, okay. Other than maybe they should watch some sci-fi movies. You know, the, the thing that comes back cloned usually kills people. <laughs> In those sci-fi movies, you know, <laughs> or like a pet cemetery type of, you know, response to resurrection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and as far as the trainer dog relationship, you know, I think most trainers can train most dogs. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if you have a fundamental knowledge base and good technical skills as a trainer, you know, and, and when I say trainer, I, I mean, you know, like, you know, the domestic pet trainer, you know, right. you know, that's what we are, right? I mean, there's us. And then there's like trainers that do some really much different stuff than we do, whether it's agility or protection or, you know, whatever the case may be. Sure, of course. But, uh, you know, I mean, as, as far as working with most dogs, most trainers can work with most dogs. I mean, you know, I mean, a, a, as people's careers develop, they may gravitate towards one area of training versus another or one type of dog versus another or, you know, I mean, training careers evolve. Um, I think that in a domestic pet setting, I would say that the environment is probably more important than the trainer or the dog. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen more environmental factors impact behavior than anything uh, the trainer did or didn't do or the dog's response to what the trainer did or didn't do. Mm. Uh, you know, and I mean, I, you know, I've had dogs over the years that, I mean, you know, they were just like, just so easy. Like I didn't change what I was doing. They were just so easy. Mm -hmm. You know, some dogs that were more challenging and, you know, these were during times where, you know, I didn't change much of my approach, uh, you know, for, you know, I, I'm talking about basic training. I'm not talking about behavior modification. Sure. Of course. All, all different, you know, ball of wax, but, uh, ball of wax. Is that it? Is that the yeah, right thing? Yeah. Ball of wax. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know what that means and I use it, but anyway, uh, I digress. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think a trainer, a trainer has more opportunity to damage a dog uh -huh. than we do to help a dog. Okay. Uh, from, and I'm talking about, you know, a regular training standpoint. Yes. Um, you know, I'm not, and I'm not talking about protocols or anything like that, but, um, making sure that holistically we are looking at the dog's life in its totality, including its environment and its owners. Right. Because, uh, and I, was this two weeks ago where we were, we were talking about uh, something to the, what were we talking about two weeks ago? Uh, what happens when you're wrong? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we miss opportunities to, to educate the owners and mm -hmm. modify the environment to set the dog up for success, Right. Then, you know, obviously that that's our responsibility. So that, you know, that would, we could be part of the problem if we're not making sure we look at the dog's life in its whole. But I, I you know, I, I, I think most, most of us can teach just about any dog, the basics that we need to teach for as, as far as pet ownership goes, um, you know, provided we're, respectful and humane mm -hmm. and, and we promote good positive relationship building with the dog and their owners. Okay. So I don't know if that answers your question. A little bit, a little bit. Bonnie, is there such a thing as an untrainable dog? 
Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, I was thinking of the cloning thing, but I'll try to <laughs> jump on that question. You threw me, honestly. Um, it's okay. They're probably, I mean, I, th I think I'm, I tend to agree with what Jeff said about environment and the owner and there probably are some untrainable dogs, dogs that are just too, uh, too damaged, too sensitive, uh, bred in a way that, that just, you know, their nerve threshold is shot and maybe those dogs you just try to make comfortable and help their environment and help the owner if the owner hopefully that dog is loving towards the owner and then I think it could be okay living with with a family or a person you know there's that aspect too so um and is that enough for, for the owner but um, I don't think that most dogs are like that at all. And I agree with Jeff that most trainers could train basic training to any dog with, if they have experience. Um, okay. And if, like Steve always says, if, you're, if you see the dog in front of you and you're, and you're really sensitive to looking at it and the environment and what enrichment it's getting in its life and what the owners feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think you really need the owners on board with any work that you come in and do with a dog. And, and that's the hard piece. That's the hard piece for, for us and which is understandably so. Okay. And David, do you think that it's, do you think it's the dog? Do you think it's the trainer? Do you think it's the owner? It could be a little bit of all, a little bit of all three, but I, you know, getting back to like what you guys were saying in terms of environment and, and genetics, I don't know much, much about genetics either. You know, it's, but the way I would equate it to it in an odd way would be you take a look at twins, okay, people like Serena Williams or Venus Williams or the McEnroes for tennis. A lot of them mm -hmm. have are the, are the same kind of have the same trainers and so forth, but do they don't they, are they play exact and they may even play the same players. Are, are, are the are the uh, outcomes the same? Not always. And one was always a little bit better than the other in certain circumstances. Sure. And then you look at nutrition, people-wise, dog-wise, nutrition, environment, what, what, what circumstance? Is it raining? Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? And, you know, to a certain extent, there is some genetic component to it, but I also think that there, it's, there's some environmental component to it as well. And as we all know, dogs don't generalize well. So they may do really well in one environment and like so-so in another environment. Uh, mm -hmm. environment and then then on top of that then you then you put the uh, the different person who's working with that dog both could be equally good trainers but for whatever reason there's more of a comfort level with that trainer the dog's taken to that trainer versus the other trainer <clears throat> and then we also have to you know the old saying goes we're not always training the dog we're training the owner to train the dog right you know so it's kind of the way I always uh, equate it to it to a certain extent which is not exactly this right way is a third and a third and a third a third of it's on me, a third of it's on the owner, and a third of it's on the dog. So between the three of us, we have to kind of work together to get the dog to, to respond to what we're looking to do. But um, it's, uh, as Steve would say, it's, it's a complicated thing. <laughs> yes, it's, it, it's complicated, yes. It's, but, and... uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, it's, there, there's too many variables in there, I, I think. That's, that's, that's the problem, to make it, everything's got to be exact. If you had the exact the trainer, and that one trainer was working both dogs separately under the right, same exact environment, everything, both dogs are getting fed exactly the same. We're talking about genetically, both the genetic dogs. Same environment, same circumstances, same temperature, everything's exact, then maybe you could, you could make it more predictable where both are going to be the same, you get the both, same response. But how do you mm -hmm. how, how do you get those kind of how do you set that up? It's not we don't we don't work in a, in a lab. <laughs> you know this is all right. fluid. It's all you know right. But you know to get back to what Steve was saying at the beginning about the fact that the dogs are different that you can have the same genetics but they can be the, the different dog. You know one of the things that I was thinking about was also there was an article about I believe it's Barbara Streisand who cloned her dog thinking that she was going to be getting the same dog and then wound up 
with a different dog. And would that have made a difference if she had had the same trainer? Would that have made the difference if, uh, you know, if it was somebody else with that dog? Would the dog have been totally different? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and so how, how important is, is the trainer, Steve? How important is what the trainer does? I, I, it's a, it's about the goals, I think. Okay. It's about the goals. You know, you can, you can decide for, for the, for the client, you know, what you want to teach the dog, but if, if it's their goals, I mean, I think success is based on what they think of as, you know, success. Like th there was this guy years ago, that was uh, one of these AKC like high-end competition guys. Had a golden retriever, won, 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 you know, 200 points, 200 points, that kind of stuff. Right, but, which is which is extremely high, obviously, yeah. That's it, top score, 200. Yeah, okay. So he, he keeps getting these dogs, you know, and then because one gets old and he gets another one. And I, I read this thing where he says, at 10 months old, if the dog doesn't show him what is expected, he moves him along and gets another one. Hmm. So he doesn't have a real relationship, you know. Oh, he may. I shouldn't say that he didn't, you know. But he's he's willing to take a ten month old dog that he has like poured his blood, sweat, and tears into. But of course, it's not going to be a two hundred. It's moving right. along, and I'm getting something else because this guy's got a goal, two hundred points, and so he's looking for that dog that can provide that. He's not. He he doesn't have to necessarily change the way he trains he's he's the guy who makes 200 he knows how to do it if the dog isn't doing it for him he doesn't look at himself he looks at the dog and so i don't really you know there, there's a whole moral thing involved in all sure. this but it's about the goal i mean it's you could be an amazing trainer but you may not have a, a dog that reaches the potential that you think it should reach in the meantime, you know, I know a lot of people probably haven't reached the potential they think they were going to reach or what. I mean, you know, sure. it's a life. I, I, where do you give it up? You know, where do you give it up? We're talking about dogs. I mean, if you take them into your house as family and stuff, it's different. The goals tend to be different. If it's social, if it's not destructive, if it's housebroken, you know, some basic like manners kind of thing, not necessarily... Uh, the frisbee or competition obedience or the, it, but if you've got this goal and you're really competition minded then you're going to be the person who's looking for a certain dog if you're a show person you definitely yes. want a certain people to get your dog from and all that stuff if you're work people you're doing that you're traveling all over the darn world to try to find that perfect work dog i mean it is complicated but it, mm -hmm. it it's and it's big it's big because if you're a family, I mean, the people we tend to serve are families. They have dogs. If they have problems, we're there to try to help them through that stuff, iron it out as best we can, knowing what we know. And I think expectations, um, so they have goals, but then we come in and we say, well, it's nice to have that idea, but maybe you should think a little bit like differently, you know? Mm -hmm. We're not going to Ivy League, okay? We go, state school is fine, you know. Maybe, uh -huh. you know what I mean. Maybe we're going to whatever trade school. What, what, what? There's a need for all this stuff, right? I mean, but if you think you've got an Ivy League dog and the dog's like, nah, you know, doesn't make it a bad dog, right? Right. So but it's about people. It's about goals. I mean, not, they got to feel for the dogs. I mean, I know we all do. We have we have the feeling for them. The people, right. Not so much. But aren't we? Aren't aren't scientists doing a lot of research now about genetics with dogs and with uh, emotions in dogs? And when when is it too much, Jeff? When when are we messing around too much? When are we saying, okay, here is this dog that I want that, yes, we did this with breeding at one point, but now we have the ability to do it with genetics. When is too much? I, 
I don't follow you at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you mean? You, you, start, you started out by emotions and testing, and now you're talking. because because they can change the they can change the they can change the temperament of the dogs. Yeah, they're starting to be able to change the temperament of the dogs genetically. Oh, I think okay. So this isn't about cloning. Well, I guess it is, but it's more about. I mean, if if you could do that with breeding instead of with cloning when when is it too much when are we mess when are we not letting a dog be a dog i don't know we're talking about a species that's been around for fifteen thousand years mm -hmm. so anything that they do now i mean it doesn't really mean much to me okay i'm just being honest i mean okay it's a dog, it's a dog right right um, you know, I, I can tell you that if we look at breeds, when a breed starts experiencing problems, whether it's genetics or health issues or temperament issues, there is a common denominator behind those problems, and that's people. Um, overbreeding, inbreeding, breeding for looks as opposed to temperament, a la American Pit Bull Terriers, right? Sure. They want certain colors. They want a certain size now. Uh, and then when they got the certain size, they renamed it the American Bully, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's just ridiculous what they do with dogs. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Now, the only thing I would add to that, and I don't know myself, would be, you know, maybe I'm getting too sci-fi on this whole thing, but if it's, if it's getting to the point where, you know, someone, it gets into the wrong hands and they want to alter um, the behavior in such a way where it's, you know, you're really getting a dog that's going to be miserable no matter what, what kind of training you do. And you could be the greatest trainer in the world that you're not going to get that dog to do anything other than just, you know, lash out at you or whatever. It's going to be aggressive and you have other dogs that are aggressive or potentially or, or extremely shy and, and it just, just whatever it is, just something that's no one's going to want this dog and, they, and, and it just goes into the wrong hands. Then well, it's the, the, only, the only person who's going to want the dog is the person who has the dog is what you Right. Maybe they is. want it for protection or whatever, which yeah. a protection dog is fine. But if, you, but if a protection dog that's going to be unpredictable and unreliable and you tell it a command or whatever, and it's like, yeah, maybe I'll do it today, but maybe I won't do it today. I'm gonna still bite whatever. Mm -hmm. Then, then it's then 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 there's a problem there, obviously. Yeah, I agree with you, David. It's it gets scary when, I mean, there you know you start thinking about the experiments on people and twins, and there was something in the Soviet Union, some big experiment with either fox or wolves or just. You know, testing, and I, I just get don't like all that testing on animals, we period. Learned, we learned a lot yeah. that, that Russian thing with the foxes, though. I mean, you know. Yeah. What we, was it, Steve? That it, was, I just. Oh, that was like one of the most important, like, I think, you know, that that's, you know, you got to. I, I, I just remember seeing whatever I saw in the fox. It just looked. Yeah. It just emotionally it upset me just seeing what they were doing the thing is what they did was they because they had they were fox farming you know initially it wasn't a pretty deal right they just had fox farms in like near siberia so but they were having trouble handling these foxes hey they were killing them you know i can understand why the foxes would talk back about it but so they decided to start to breed the friendly ones to the friendly ones to see if they could make them friendly and in like whatever, eight to 10 generations, the color changed, right? They became like, they look like Bernese mountain dogs. They were like tricolor. They barked, like all kinds of like things started to happen just from breeding friendly to friendly. Mm -hmm. like a huge famous like study. I yeah. His name, but some, I've heard it enough times, but I always forget. Anyway, you know, so the, now they say, well, how come the color changed? Well, that makes, these colorful foxes look more pleasing to the human eye, you know. So there's like it's an interesting thing how this domestication made the color change, right? They, it was always red fox to red fox. It's not yes. like breeding for color; they were breeding strictly for temperament, and the color changed after like ten generations. So many years later, 
they went back and they said, let's breed aggressive to aggressive, but let's socialize the, the baby kids to see if we're handling them and we treat them with kindness and a lot of handling, will they be okay? Well, guess what? Not okay. They were not. Vicious, hmm. Right? So the, that's an ugly video too. I've seen that video. That's really ugly because they're stressed to death. You try <laughs> They are like flying at you. I mean, and they handled them from babies, mm. but didn't make an impression because the genetics were so strong. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. The fox thing, you know, the Russian fox thing, super, you know. Yeah, it was know. interesting. I just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, just personally, I yeah. Know. But, you know, that's with science, the way they use animals for testing. and. But it's behavioral. And, you know, they took care of these things. It wasn't like they were, you know, kind of injecting them with things and blinding them. And, you know, true, or, true. They were on. they were confined, and it was not their natural habitat, and they were in cages. And so, yeah. It wasn't the best, but at least we learned, we did learn a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Genetics-wise, we learned, I think, a lot from those studies. So, yeah. It's interesting. It's like sending uh, monkeys in space that obviously weren't going to come back. They helped figure out how to do, you know, for man to, to do, be able to do it. Yeah, but, you know, they, well, they could have just sent up a robot. They didn't really have to send up a monkey, did they? Oh, <laughs> I wish they hadn't sent it. But when I see the picture of that monkey strapped in, I go like, oh, like, oh no, how horrible. <laughs> All right. Um, we should clone, they should, right, do cloning on robots. And cloning then... on robots, yes, okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to end it today with this. Uh is science affecting dog training too much? And then just a real quick answer to that. Uh, and I'll start with you, Steve. No, no. Science is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Okay. David? No, I would agree. I would agree with Steve. I mean, I think science is, is where it's at. As long as it's in the, the right hands and so forth, it could be very useful. Okay. And Bonnie? Um, I'm in the middle. Yes, very much. And there is some no. Okay. So I'm right in the middle. Okay. And Jeff? Absolutely. Yes. Is it the fearing too much? Because we are getting too preoccupied with data and we are pushing aside the spiritual relationship between people and dogs in, in the name of science. And okay. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, as usual, it was a very interesting discussion. And as Steve always says, it's complicated. And boy, this was complicated. So again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank you all for watching today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.